Okay. Cool. And I think you know, you know, to have a discussion like you know, among you know you guys, it's a whole lot easier when it is in a classroom. You know, you guys can actually turn to each other and talk about things. I mean, we don't do that a whole lot in this class. You know, but when you guys want to, I mean, you, know, I'm totally open to you know, just having a discussion. All right, very good. We are down to the last seventy something minutes. <laughs> So what I'll do is I'm going to give you um, a question. You know, this is the, it's the format of one of the questions in an earlier exam, in the final exam. It has to do with probabilities. But this one is interesting. So let me first you know, type the question out, and then I'll you know, tell you guys you know, how to process it. Okay. All right. So um, Jack has um, 13 coins in his pocket. <clears throat> I have recorded. I'm recording already, so you don't have to worry about you know, typing everything down. Um, so I'm gonna say six are of type one. So type one, and of course the remaining seven are of type two. Type one coins have a probability. Rephrase it a little bit. The chances of a head for type one is, I'm just gonna throw out some number here, 0.4. The chances of a head for type two is point, eh, we'll make this one 0.6. All right, so, so, so far we know that there are 13 coins, okay, all together in a pocket or a bag or pounds, however you want to call that. We know six of those are of one particular type with a chances of landing on the head being 0.4, and then the other type would have a chance of landing on the head of 0.6. So are we, are we doing okay so far? There are two types of coins in the same pocket, in the same bag, okay? Um, Jack, um, okay, so let me see how to phrase it. <clears throat> okay, Jack picks. Um, let's not go too crazy about this. Three coins out of the pocket and flip flips each one once. What are the chances that we that he ends up with two heads? And one tail. Okay. <laughs> so this one is okay. So it's not a very difficult question, right? You know, you basically you know, Jack just reach into his pocket, you know, which originally has thirteen coins, six of type one, seven of type two. You know, just pick out three coins, okay? Flip one, put it on the table. Flip the second one, put it on the table. Put the third one, put it on the table. And I'm just asking you, what are the chances that we end up with two heads and one tail? All right, so this is one of those two in one kind of problem because there are two problems within this one single question. I already know what my son is going to do to answer this question. He's gonna write a tiny little Python program and simulate the whole thing, just use a random number generator, go for those you know, same your probability, and just run the simulation like 20 gazillion times and you know, tell me what the average is. That would not be the right approach on, a, uh, on an exam where the answer is supposed to be on paper. So how would you do this? So first thing is you need to map this to concepts that we have already introduced in this class. So when it comes to probability, what again, you know, tell me what is one uh, type of problem and what is the other type of problems? Say that? Binomial counting. This one, one is called binomial distribution and the other one is cortical counting. Very good. So binomial distribution, you know, the probability is pretty easy to figure out because we got that sigma notation, right? You know, so if you tell me, well, you know, um, this many heads and this many tails, if this is the total, I can easily give you the answer. Except we got two different types of coins. <laughs> so the probability is not exactly the same. 
Okay. And then the other one is a counting problem, um, which is, you know, kind of, if you want a good example of the counting problem, Lotto is a good example of the counting problem. So in order to figure out a probability from a counting problem, you need to figure out what is your E, your event, and then divide the cardinality of E by the cardinality of omega, and omega is representing you know, all the possible outcomes. This one doesn't fall into one category, fair and square. It falls into two, both of those categories. So what you need to do is to look at the process, and you break it up into two distinct parts. The first part is, how do we get those three points? That's the first part. The second one is, once we have those three points, okay, which can be zero of type one, three of type two, one of type one, two of type two, two of type one, one of type two, and three of type one, and zero of type two. Does that make sense? So there are four different scenarios when we get to the second stage. For each one of the possibility for the second stage, you apply the binomial distribution. So that's kind of you know, how we break the problem down. So what we need to do first is to look at the first part of the process. Okay, so we are going to look at this as a two-part thing. So part one is to look at the chances of, okay, three type one, zero type two. And you can probably just kind of imagine you know, what is the rest of this. <clears throat> and I'll just copy and paste this four times. And then I'll go ahead and change the, the values. So two, one, zero. And then the other one would go from uh, zero, one, two, three. Okay. So now that I give you these you know, four subproblems, how do we figure out the probability of each of the subproblems? I'm not even flipping, I'm just asking, okay? Of the 13 coins in my pocket, what are the chances that I'm going to get three of the type one and none of the type two? So I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit back a little bit and see, you know, how you guys are going to approach this problem. Yep. Is it um, the type one, six out of 13 times five out of 12 times 4 out of 11? Uh, that sounds more complicated than it needs to be. Say that one more time. Let me just make sure that I... So the probability of choosing the first type 1 coin is 6 out of 13, right? And then once that uh, type 1 coin is gone, there are 5 type 1 coins and 12 coins in total. Mm -hmm. So the probability of choosing um, the type 1 is 6 out of 13 the first time, and then the second time, uh, the um, probability of choosing that coin is 5 out of 12. Uh, so you multiply them together. Why is it out of 12? Huh? Why is it out of 12? Because this, you, you remove that from the set. Oh, okay, I see. I see. Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. So 6 out of 13 the first time, you remove that coin from the set. Now there's 5 type 1 coins, 12 coins in total. So the, the chance of drawing a type 1 coin is 5 out of 12. And then uh, the last time is 4 out of 11. So, and you multiply them all together for that, uh, for the chance, probability of that one. Okay. Um, so, um, that's one way to look at this. I'm not sure whether that will give me exactly the same answer, but it sounds legitimate. So, um, so me, let me just kind of write down you know, what you're proposing. So, we'll pick this one, you know, as your, you know, as the answer. So, what you're proposing is, you know, the first type one coin, and how many of the type one? We got six of those. So you have 6 divided by 13 of a chance to pick the first type 1 coin. And then you have 5 divided by 12 of a chance to pick the second type 1. And then you have 4 divided by 11 you know, for selecting the third coin. That looks right to me, okay? But the way I look at this is a little bit different. So the way I look at this is um, the, uh, using the lotto example is uh, once we have the five winning numbers, and the remaining 64 non-meaning numbers. So the so I'm I'm basically calculating if I need two of these and then three of those, what is the probability? And I think it boils down to the same thing. Okay, so we'll we'll take a look at this particular answer. 
So this is answer number one, which I think is actually correct. And the way you derive it, you know, sounds uh, reasonable as well. But the way I'm going to derive this is to look at um, the number of ways, okay, I'm using combination here, to find the six, uh, to choose three of the six of the type one, and the number of ways to choose um, zero of the type two. But then I have to divide it by uh, what is the total number of, you know, picking three coins out of 13 coins. So that's the way I look at it. You know, the second way um, is related to the way we look at lotto tickets. Because you can get a, you know, get a non-jackpot kind of reward if you match like two of the winning numbers, three of them non, and then you have the other three numbers not matching anything, you can still get a partial you know, a win. So now the question is, do they boil down to exactly the same thing? All right. So how do we, uh, <clears throat> we, can, we can compute this you know, using a spreadsheet, but we can also use equations, right, you know, to figure out you know, whether that is going to boil down to exactly the same thing. And I will be, I, my instinct, is, my gut is telling me that it boils down to the same thing, but I'm not 100% sure, okay? So what we'll do is we will actually write it out, okay? The first number, you know, six choose three, is six factorial divided by three factorial, okay? Three factorial times three factorial. And then the second one is, um, well, that's an easy one because, you know, anything choose zero is, how many ways can I choose nothing out of a bag? Exactly. So that's just one. And then we have to divide this whole thing by uh, 13 factorial divided by um, 10 factorial times 3 factorial. Okay, let me double check. Yeah, that looks right to me. All right, so the question is, do these two boil, to, boil down to exactly the same value? So we'll take a look. And I think they do. Um, so six, div uh, six factorial divided by three factorial is six times four times, six times five times four. So that would be the same thing as this six times five times four. <clears throat> but we also have to divide fact uh, three factorial one more time. So I think the problem here is in this particular case, the ordering is important. So you have to divide. Um, okay, so let me let me see how to take care of that. Do, do you see what the, what the issue is? Yeah, you know, because in in your case, um, you are counting. Okay, let's number the type one coins as A, B, C, D, E, F. Are you seeing other difference? Hmm? Are you seeing other difference? They look different to me. I calculated them. Um, they're exactly the same? They're exactly the same. Oh, okay. All right. At least decimal. The, the fractions are different, but, but it just comes down to um, an some sort of irrational. It's a rounding thing. thing. Huh? It, it's basically a rounding thing. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm just looking at the math here, and I think, you know, so that means the three factorial here has to be absorbed, you know, somehow by, uh, oh, I see how it's being absorbed. Because we, we got a three factorial here, we also got a three factorial here. So that's basically how that one is gone. And then 13 factorial divided by 10 factorial is 13 times 12 times 11. And that's why, you know, they boil down to exactly the same thing. Yeah. Cool. But we can now see two different ways of approaching this problem, right? So the next one, <clears throat> using um, Anthony's method, this one is going to be um, 6 divided by 13 times 5 divided by 12. And then at that point, we want one of the um, type 2. We still have 7 of those, and we only got 11 coins left. Is that right? Okay. So, and then with this one, we have um, 6 div divided by 13, uh, 7 divided by 12, and then 6, oops, 6 divided by 11. So the difference here is um, 
these two are accounting for the type one coins and then this one here is accounting for the type two coin and then on the third in the third subcase this is the only one taking care of the only type one coin and then these two are take, taking care of the type two coin and then for the last one okay if we just kind of extend this reasoning then we have 7 divided by 13 times 6 divided by 12 times 5 divided by 11 because all three are type 2 coins. Using the other method, the generalization using the other method is going to be A2 equals to uh, combine you know, 6 and this time we only want two of those times combine 7 we want one of those and then divided by combine 13, 3, that one stays constant you know, for all three you know, possible cases. All right. And then for the next one, <clears throat> I'm just copy and pasting because there's a pattern to this whole thing. So we are now just changing. We only need one from type 1, and we need two from type 2. And the uh, denominator is, state of, is the same. And then for the last one, we got... We have zero of type one, three of type two, and that's it. So I, I'm pretty sure for all four cases, you know, either A1 or A2 will give you the correct answer. So are we okay so far? All right. Okay. So for each subcase, then we also have to figure out you know, what are the chances that we end up with uh, two heads and one tail. Okay, so now we have the subproblem of you know, three type one. Uh, what is the, what are the chances of three head and none tail, no tail? So this one is either is is the easiest because this one falls fair and square into the uh, binomial distribution because we only got one probability. They all belong to the same type of coin. So that means you know, um, the chances of you know, three type one and zero tail, given that all three are of type two, type one already, that's easy because now we just have your know, combine three, um, three, well, three, zero, three, three. Three, three is fine, okay, looks better. And if we multiply this to the chances of um, getting ahead, okay, times 0.4 to the power of 3 in this case. So if you really want to be you know, complete, you can also mention that it is also uh, times 1 minus 0.4 oops, to the power of 0. I mean, that doesn't really change anything, but that component is supposed to be there. So are we okay so far with, you know, let me make this very clear, given three type 1 coins, okay, because, you know, that is a very important part, it's conditional to the fact that we are already having three type 1 coins, the chances of all, you know, all three coins landing on the head is going to be 3 choose 3, which is just 1, times 0.4 to the power of 3, times 1 minus 0.4, which is 0.6, to the power of zero. Is that okay so far? I think I just made a mistake because we're looking for two head and one tail, right? And I just computed three heads. So that's actually incorrect. <clears throat> All right, so, so what we need to do, I mean, it's correct if this is what we want, but that is not what we want because the question is asking, what are the chances that we end up with two heads and one tail? So that was my bad because I was not paying attention. So this is two, this is two, and this is one. There we go. All right, so that looks right to me. Any questions about that part? So the next question is, how do we combine these two probabilities? Because A1 or A2, because they, all, you know, they, they both computed the same value, so how do we combine A1 or A2 with this probability here? I'll just give it a uh, B1 as a, as a name. Okay, just looking for my cursor. 
So we'll call this one your B1, okay? So how do we combine A1 and B1 or A2 and B1? So that we have the actual probability of um, actually getting three type one coins, zero type two coins from choosing from the 13, and also ending up with two heads and one tail. Multiply them together. Just multiply, yep, exactly. So, so we have A, um, so A1 times B1 is the probability of three of, okay, so I have to, I'm going to be very careful with how I write this, choosing three type one coins from all the coins and have two head, one tail from tossing the three type one coins. Okay. Yep. Is the A1 the probability of it being all three coins of being type one? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, so three type one, zero type two, you know, you can either use A1, which is a uh, easier to read format, or you can use A2, which is resembling the format that we used in class uh, when we were working on the lotto problem, okay. mm -hmm. they boil down to the they boil down to the same number, because you know I once you look at the uh, uh, expansion of combination, um, both of these would boil down to the same value. Uh, let me just make sure that I add enough um, parentheses. Yep. So I think we need one more. There we go. All right. So that's the easy one. But the second and the third cases are the harder ones. So let's take a look at the second case. So the second case is we want to have two type one and uh, one type two coins. So we got the probability already. So if somebody was to ask me if I you know, combine the type one and the type two coins in the pocket with a total of 13 coins, what are the chances that I end up you know, choosing two of the type one coins and one of the type two coins? We got that figured out already. But the problem now is, given that we have two type one and one type two coins, what are the chances that we end up with two heads and one tail? So that gets a little bit interesting, because now you can say, hmm, who is contributing that tail? Because that tail can now be contributed by the type one or the type two. So we have two subcases in this case. Okay, so let me describe the two subcases. <clears throat> so subcase one is okay. This is just an easy way to describe the problem. So this one, I can say the tail is contributed by the one of the one of the type one points. Okay. Okay. So if that is the case, okay, if we just look at subcase one. What is the probability of subcase one happening? Given, okay, we are already assuming that we have two type one and one type two. So what are, how, how do we process this? So this one has two subcomponents. So the subcase itself has two subcomponents. So we have, you know, type one has a pattern of one head, one tail, because we already said here the tail is contributed by one of the type one. And then for the type 2, it would contribute just a one head. Okay? And each one is its own binomial distribution. They do not belong to the same binomial distribution because the probabilities are different. So with the first one, you have to figure out the, the, uh, out of the, type, the two type 1 coins have getting one head and one tail, this becomes, you know, combin. Um, two, choose one. Yep. Uh, would it be incorrect to average the chance of um, getting the, the a certain result? So if these are two type one coins and then one type two coins, could you add 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and divide by three to get the what value I'm not sure whether it would get to the same answer. So you know, we'll, we can always test that later. 
Um, so I'm just going to go by you know, the distribution itself. So we are, I'm going to ignore the more intuitive way, you know, as you suggested first, and then we can then take a look and see if we can prove whether they are the same or not. So it will be 0.4 to the power of 1 because we have one head, and then we'll 0.6, okay, times 0.6 to the power of 1 as well because we have one tail in that case. And then we have one extra thing. So this one extra thing is having a type 2 coin contributing just the one head. So this time we have combined 1 choose 1, and it will be times 0.6 to the power of 1 times 0.4 to the power of 0. All right. Hmm. OK, so now what do we do with these two probabilities? Do we multiply these two, or do we add these two? So let me, let me explain what each part is talking about, OK? So type 1, 1 H, 1 T is explaining the probability of given that we have exactly two type 1 coins. We somehow end up with one head, one tail. What are the chances that that's going to happen? This is the, the, this, the, based on the binomial distribution, this is the probability of how you know, often that's going to happen. The second one is saying, okay, of the third coin, okay, which I know is a, one, is a, is a type 2 coin, what are the chances that we get just one head? Well, I mean, you know, all of this stuff here, is totally redundant. All we know is all we need to know is 0.6 because you know, according to the given of the question, the chances of a head for a type two coin is just 0.6. So the question is, given these two components, how do we combine them? Because we know that we have to combine both of those into a single number. So are we adding or are we subtracting? Or are we multiplying or are we dividing? What do you think? Multiply. Multiply. Very good. So why are we multiplying? Okay, can can you explain why we are multiplying in this case? I think you got a gut feeling of why they should be multiplied. Isn't it um, counting? Basically. Well, these two are not exactly counting, but if you look at it from the perspective of a tree, mm -hmm. they belong to the same branch. Okay. So because they, because when they when they belong to the same branch, then you should multiply. I see. Because the other way to look at this is there's an implicit and in between. So and and multiplication are related, or and addition are, re, are, are related. So in this case, there's an and, because of the three coins, what, are, what is the criteria of these three coins for this particular subcase? We have two type one, one head, one tail, and we have a type two contributing one head. So that and is suggesting, very strongly suggesting, that we have a multiplication because we need both of them at the same time. So if one has one particular probability, the other one has the other probability, then we have to add, we have to multiply something. We have to multiply the two probabilities to look at both of them happening at the same time because we need both of them to be happening at the same time. Are we doing okay so far with this? Now this one is particularly um, tedious, but I want to use it as an example, you know, just so that we know how to process this, okay? So now we have subcase two. Subcase two is the, head, the tail is contributed by the type two coin, because we only got one of the type two coin, so we can just say the type two coin in this case. All right, so how do we work this out? The type ones will be contributing two head, none of the tail, and then the type two will contribute one single tail, but no head. Okay, so zero H, one T. So are we okay so far with this notation? We are still working within the subcase of two type one, 
one side two coins, okay, Zero out of the pocket. That's what I have chosen. But this time, I want to compute the chances of the type one coin is contributing the two heads, uh, the two heads of the two head one tail, and then the type two coin, which is which I only have one, is contributing the only tail. I mean, do okay so far with this? You know, which you know, what subcase two is representing? All right. <clears throat> So the way we calculate this is very similar to the first one. So um, we, I'm just going to <clears throat> do some copy and pasting here because there's a certain format to this whole thing, which is based on the binomial distribution. So the equation has the same format. It's the only thing that's, that's different is now we are saying, oh, we got two heads. So that means, you know, um, when we raise the power of 0.4, which is the chances of a type one ending up on a head is going to be two, and then the chance, and then we have zero tail in this case. And then with the other one, it's going to be one, zero, because you know, we, we do not want any head. So when we raise the power of 0.6, which is the chances of end landing on a head, that would be a zero in this case. And then when we look at 0.4, which is the chances landing on the tail, that's going to be a one in this case. So I'm just going to pause here and see if we are okay with this map so far. Are we good? Okay. So if I keep, you know, I, I have to assign you know, numbers to these things or you know, a, a destination. So if I call this one C1 and I call this one you know, uh, D1, I think I'm done with this entire thing of um, two type one, yeah, you know, one type two. Okay, so at this point, I, I'm done with this entire thing. So now that I have a one, c one, and d one, how do we combine those three numbers? The previous case was easy. Okay, with the previous case. We just multiply A1 by B1, and we're done. But that's only because we have every, all the coins are of one single type. This time, we have two different types of coins, two of type 1, one of type 2. And then we have these two numbers here, C1 and D1. So once again, the analysis is going to be based on, are we talking about and, or are we talking about or here? What do you think? So, which two cases are we talking about? We got one head, one tail from the type one, one head from the type two, and then the other one is two head, zero tail from the two type one, and then one tail contributed by the type two. So are we using an and, or are, using, are we using an or to connect between these two subcases? It's an or, okay, that is an or. So remind me again, you know, what does OR correspond to when it comes to arithmetic operators? Addition, very good. So that means if I want to look at the entire probability of this thing, it would be uh, A1 times, in parentheses, uh, C1 plus D1. Are we good so far? All right. So I, I need to give these also you know, specific names. Um, let me see. I can call this one W. Okay. Ah. okay. I can call this one W. We'll call this one X. All right. What about this case here? So in this case, um, out of the three coins that I have picked out of you know, 13 coins, we ended up with one type one and two type two. So how do we work this math out? If I want to be as lazy as possible, where do I copy and paste from? Do I copy and paste from the top, you know, type three type one, zero type two, or do I copy from the second one, which is two type one, one type two? The second one. The second one, okay. That is correct. Okay, it's almost symmetric in a certain way, but it's not. Okay, so we're going to have to 
do some processing here. Okay. And I copy and paste it too much. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this one also has two subcases, but this time, um, since I only have one type one coin, so that means, well, it's either contributing the head or it is contributing the tail. So that becomes the easy one. But I do have two of the type two coins. So that becomes the slightly more complicated case because the type two can contribute one head. In this case, you know, the remaining one has to be one tail or it can contribute uh, two heads in this case, two head and zero tail. All right, so let me double check. Does that make sense? Am I accounting for all the heads and all the tails that I want in each one of the subcases? So I'm going to double check. So you have one head, two heads, one tail, two head, one tail, we're good. And then we have one tail, two head, okay, we're good too. So now we have to go into the um, binomial distribution term and just you'll know, fix that up a little bit. <clears throat> So the way we fix it up, okay, is I keep looking at the wrong screen. So now we only have one, choose one, and we have one head, we have zero tail in this case. And then for the other one, we are looking at one, choose zero, because we do not have any heads. In other words, how many we choose from, um, the other one, is counting the number of heads, okay? You know, that becomes you know, what I'm actually counting. So in this case, we have zero head, which means the power corresponding to the probability of landing on the head is zero. And then the power corresponding to, or the exponent corresponding to the chances of landing on the tail is going to be one. So now I can move on to the type two. We have one head, one tail. So that means out of two tosses, we have one that is landing on the head. So there's one here, and we also have one over here. And then for the other one, we have two tosses. Two are both, both of those are landing on the head. So that means you know, we have to raise the chances of landing on the head to two, and then, the, and then we have to raise the chances of landing on the tail to zero in this case. Are we still good? Yep. Uh, why are you not considering uh, two, two tails of type two? Um, because the question wants to find out the probability of two head and one tail, so we do not have a two tail situation. All right, we'll call this one Y. And then finally, we have the last case, which is actually resembling the first case. So we can just kind of copy and paste from the first case and do some minor changes to it and then we are done. We are done with it. So I'll copy and paste this much. And just paste. Um, let me see. Am I copy and pasting correctly? Yep. Okay. So this one is copy and paste correctly. I just have to change that in this case. We have zero type one, three type two coins, okay? Given three type two coins, um, two head, one tail. All I have to do is changing you know, the point four to the point six because that's the difference between the type one versus the type two. And then the other one is, okay, look at double checking. So we have the point six. Oh, right. So this becomes you know, point four and not just not, one minus 0.4, so that's all I need to change. Let me double check. 0.6 to the power of two times 0.4 to the power of one, that is correct. And then we'll call this term Z. All right. So now we have W, X, Y, and Z. And I need to come up with a single number, right? How do we combine W, X, Y, Z? So once again, the way you think about it is, are we talking about N or are we talking about OR? Or either of them. 
they're all ORD. Yep, very good. So that means we are adding those two, adding those four numbers. So that means you know, the final answer, final answer is W plus X plus Y plus Z. That would be the chances of um, getting two heads and one tail after we pick out three coins out of 13 coins. And within the 13 coins, we have six of type one, seven of type two. The type one coins have a, chances, have a chance of landing on the head of 0.4, and then the type two has a chance of landing on the head of 0.6. I mean, the 0.4 and the 0 0.6 is just some random number that I chose, okay? And they just turn out to be complementary. They don't have to be at all complementary. But the method of thinking about this is like this. So are we good so far with this one? Yeah, you know, where, you know, we are um, given the problem. It's a little bit long, a little bit complex you know, compared to a kind of like it's either this or that, you know, because in the previous problems, we are looking at either the binomial distribution or we are looking at the counting problem. This one is a mixture of the two. Yep. I um, computed it by averaging the um, chances of um, the big heads or tails between the coins, and um, they're suspiciously close, but not quite, about 1% there. There's about a 1% difference. 1% is not because of error. Um, because in this case, what if you're are you using a spreadsheet or are you just you know, writing all the numbers by hand? Writing all the numbers into the Google search bar. Okay. So you're using Google spreadsheet to do all the calculation? No. No? I typed it into the uh, search bar. Okay. I don't think the average approach would give you exactly the same value. And this time, I also picked the 0 0.4 and 0 0.6, and they are actually complementary also already. If you just look at the probability of landing on the head between the type 1 and type 2, and then the fact that we also have 6 and 7, so that's a very fairly even match. So I'm not sure that they are supposed to be coming out the same if you just do the average. Because I think the counting part actually does matter. Um, it, it matters more when we have fewer coins. So if you look at a sub, if you look at a, um, another problem similar to this, but this time we only have six coins in the pocket, three of each type, then I think the counting method will give you a quite different answer compared to the average method. Um, the more coins you have, the closer it is to just averaging. So if we have 30,000 of type one and 30,000 of type two, I'm not sure you know, whether your pants can hold on to you know, that many coins, but if that is the case, I think it will be very, very close to just averaging. All right, so that's one kind of a problem I want to kind of have you guys to think about. Now with a probability type of thing, I can also reverse the whole thing. I can give you the answer of something and then give you the structure of the problem, and then you guys have to reverse it to find out what is the actual probability. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So let's just say that one internet, uh, one network packet is, has 1,000 bits, okay? Let me just write it down so this way it's actually easier to refer to. Okay, so we have uh, a new problem, okay? So I'm just gonna use this to kind of do a new page, okay? So one packet has 1,000 bits. The chances of having um, zero or one bit, uh, zero, okay, I'll, I'll make it slightly more complicated. One or two bits of error is, uh, I'll just say your point nine 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 five. okay? So I can now ask you, based on this, okay, what are the chances of um, a single bit of the error of a single bit? Okay, what are the chances of? Okay, 
I think that's the best way that I can put it right now. Okay. So one packet has 1,000 bits. And I already know that, you know, the chances of having zero, one, or two bits of error out of the entire packet is 0.99995. And that's just a random value, okay? What it really is does not matter because we want to find out what is the approach. So given that, okay, how do I go back to figure out the chances of a single bit um, being trans being not transmitted correctly? Or you can look at it as transmitted correctly. doesn't matter which way, but I'm looking at one single bit this time. So let's just you know, make it uh, transmitted correctly just so that you know it's easier to kind of read the whole thing. Okay, so how do you set this up? This is not going to be something that you can empirically solve you know, in a nice and neat you know, uh, close form. So all I need is give me an equation where you can plug it into a solver, like you know, a spreadsheet, and it will actually be able to figure out what is the chances of one single bit trans being transmitted correctly. So how do you reverse this problem? I already told you this is a reverse problem. So what you, the first thing you need to know is, hmm, are we talking about a binomial problem or are we talking about a non-binomial problem? Because that's the first distinction, because those two are easy to distinct. So how do you look at this thing here? What is the experiment? What is a trial? What are the outcomes of a single trial? Either a, a success or an error. Okay, so those are the two possible outcomes. Very good, I like that. So the two outcomes per trial is success, transmitted correctly, or failure, which is not transmitted correctly. Very good. So if you look at this question here, it is it has, there's an implication of an experiment, and there are a number of trials within that experiment. So what? how many trials are we talking about in the experiment? 1,000, okay? So there are 1,000 trials. Each trial is the transmission of one bit. Is that okay so far? So you have already answered the question of every single bit being transmitted has two possible outcomes. Just because one bit is transmitted successfully doesn't mean the next bit cannot be transmitted successfully, right? So which category of problem are we looking at? Are we looking at an accounting problem or are we looking at a binomial distribution problem? We look at a binomial, very good. So the signature of a binomial problem is you have two possible outcomes from every single trial in the experiment. And the chances of each outcome is already given to you or to be determined, okay? So how would you set up a equation so that I can at least have enough constraint to find out you know, what is the ch what are the chances of one single bit transmitting correctly? So how would you set up just an equation? Okay, I don't need you to actually solve for that number. Yep. So you don't know the um, uh, the actual probability yet. That's I'll, I'll call it a p. Okay, we'll call it p so it's easier to refer to it. Um, mm -hmm. the probability, you're solving for probability p here, and mm -hmm. you can reverse engineer that by um, setting up three different um, binomial distributions. Uh, three terms within uh, using the binomial you know, uh, theorem. Yeah. Uh huh. So you have um, a thousand two zero, uh, and then you know the uh, binomial distribution of p. And well, then actually. To the next. Oh. Okay. What the, I mean, you know, it's it's the same thing. Okay. So it would be p to the power of. Uh, 1,000. Yep. And 1 minus p to the power of 0. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that would be the probability of not having a single error within 1,000 bits. Mm -hmm. Then you, you, yeah, you set the binomial distribution for 1 and 2 errors. Okay. That is equal 
2995. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, not not yet. <laughs> okay, so we got the three numbers now. How do we combine these three numbers? You add them. You add them, exactly. Because out of one packet, you either have no error bit, or you have one error bit, or two error bits. Does that make sense? Does, does it make sense that we are trying to describe three scenarios and one of them can actually happen, given any particular time? Is that, is that okay? So that's why they're ORed, and as a result, they're basically added together. So we're looking at a sum of these three. Okay. And this has to add up to what? 0.99995 has to equal to that sum. So that is enough, um, that's sufficient constraint to find the actual value of P. I certainly would not want to solve this you know, um, in a closed form as much as it might be possible, <laughs> but it's gonna look pretty hairy. But you can plug it into a spreadsheet and use a solver to solve for it. Um, all right. So are we are we good so far in terms of you know how to solve this particular problem? All right. Okay. So, given that this problem is also discussed, let me give you a problem that relates to. Um, the graph algorithms, okay? So I'm looking for the spreadsheet that we worked on last time. Pretty sure I have it somewhere, but um, I'm just trying to see if I still have it. No, it's not anywhere here. Okay, I just have to look for it in the drive, but I cannot remember where. I cannot remember where I stash it, so I just have to look at my drive and or I can look at recent because I just worked on it on Monday. Okay, I got it. Um, there we go. So I hope you guys still remember this one. You know, this is the uh, the trace of a particular um, you know, algorithm. So when we did this trace, what was given to you? was everything that you need to know, right? I gave you the set of all the vertices. I gave you the set of all the edges. I gave you um, all the distances, right? The distance of all the edges. So everything was given to you. And we're going forward by following the algorithm to solve your, to basically you know, get this entire trace. So what if I reverse the problem? I give you this trace. And then I, give, I say, you know, try to reconstruct the unknown things as much as possible. What is the set of all the vertices? What is the set of all the edges? And give me all the, the function that gives me all the distances also. How would you reverse the process? We are looking at it right now. I mean, we are looking at the outcome of using the algorithm. And I'm asking you, you know, from the outcome, from the trace of the algorithm, how do I reconstruct the original graph and the distance function? as much as I can, okay? It's not always possible to reconstruct the original, but I'm just asking you to reconstruct as much as I can. How would you approach that problem? Okay, first of all, do we understand what I'm asking you to do? If this is what I'm giving you, and I ask you, what is the graph? What are the vertices? What are the edges? What are the distances of the edges? And I'm asking you to reconstruct as much as possible because it is possible that there are some edges that we cannot figure out from here. Okay, or the distances of some of the edges cannot be figured out using what we have here. But I'm just asking you, give me as much as possible. How would you do that? If this is the exam, okay, right now, is in the exam, what would you do? Yes? I mean, destination of the, the first row of Q. Yep, okay, so those are the destinations. So they have to be vertices, right? 
Okay, so I can certainly agree with that. You know, we can start with these, but we don't even have to do that. Okay, so there's a there's a very procedural way to do it. Okay. Yep. We know what um, edges exist between the vertices because of the uh, B and W columns. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is the that's the biggest clue is. Every single time we look at this, that is an edge. This is the for each loop trying to look into all the incoming edges to whatever vertex the V is storing. So we see one edge here. Here's another edge. Here is another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. And so on. Okay, cool. Now that we have all the edges, once you have all the edges, you get all the vertices too. Because the edges, each, the first and the second item of each tuple representing an edge, they both have to come from the set of all vertices, right? So from the edges, I can quite easily deduce what the vertices are. And also, as what you guys said, you know, these three, you know, they have to be in the initial uh, destinations. They should be included in this specific graph already, so I'm not too concerned about that. Um, worst come to worst, you just look at column B, put all of those in a set, that would be your set of vertices. Pretty easy. Okay? So now I need to look at the distances. How would I work that out? How do I work out you know, the distances of the edges? The best I could. I mean, there, there are occasions where you cannot figure out you know, the distance of a particular edge because it doesn't trigger a condition that causes the algorithm to leave behind a clue as to how to compute uh, the uh, distance of that edge. Okay. So, how would you approach that problem? How do I know the distance of the edge AR, for instance? So let me highlight first and ask you, okay, we know there's an edge AR, but what is the distance of that edge? Two, okay. Why? How do you figure out if it's two? Okay, so this one is not a very good example. Let me pick a different one. Let me pick one that is a little bit more difficult. Um, Uh, let me pick this one. Okay, so we know MP is an edge. What is the distance of the edge MP? Hmm? Or of MP itself? Mm -hmm. I mean, can you scroll up a little? Mm, we don't need to, but I can. <laughs> So, okay, so let, let me go a little bit, go back a little bit more, okay? Um, what do you need to solve this type of question? What would be the first thing you reach out to during the exam if that is actually the answer, if that's the actual question in the final exam? It's open book and open notes, right? You, you don't have to memorize anything. So I would be, I would be assuming that most of you would be you know bringing in the modules, the printout of the module, or your own notes, okay, which is going to be based on the algorithm in the module and so on and so forth. So what is the first thing you're going to reach out to if this is the question? Obviously, I have to tell you, okay, if I don't tell you which algorithm I'm using in this case to generate this trace, how can you tell that this is the outcome of Dijkstra's algorithm? Or well, there's a really good chance that it is from Dijkstra's algorithm. There are tons of clues, but just give me a few. Yeah. There's no like helper function. That There's no heuristic, yeah. no heuristic function. Okay, but the heuristic function doesn't really show up in the trace because you know, those are all part of the given. Okay, so just looking at the trace itself, how what is giving this away that yeah we're dealing with Dijkstra's algorithm instead of A star. How many variables are being tested? How many variables are getting tested? It's the amount, it's not the 
affected by the heuristic. That is, that won't be the way that I differentiate this. I'll be looking at the name of the variables. In other words, the first thing I'm reaching out to are the two algorithms. <laughs> Look at the two algorithms. One has a set of Q, the other one has a set of O. That's Q. It's Dijkstra's algorithm. Only Dijkstra's algorithm keeps track of the L value, and the L value is representing the length of the shortest known path at whatever time slice you're looking at from a vertex to a destination. Okay? So the L value is only used in Dijkstra's algorithm. The A star algorithm has G and F. Okay? So just the notation itself is kind of giving this whole thing away. It's like, yeah, we, we are looking at a trace of Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay. So knowing that this is Dijkstra's algorithm, how do you go back to the algorithm and go like, okay, so how do I use the trace itself to try to salvage the graph, the original graph, as much as I can? Yeah, remember the actual problem that I'm asking you? I know MP is an edge, and that's because in the for each loop, I'm iterating through all the incoming edges to variable V, so I'm looking at all the incoming edges to vertex P in this case, and one edge, one of those edges, the only edge actually in this case, is MP, okay? So I know MP is an edge, but I want to figure out what is the distance of MP. So the question is, what clue is already in this trace here to help me figure out the distance of MP? So that's the question. I want to describe the approach to solve that problem. So you look at the clue, okay? We essentially, we're looking at, is there an update of some kind that has a numerical value that I can hang on to and go like, okay, there's a, there's num a number here that is somehow based on the distance of that edge. So what, what number is do you think is uh, related to the distance from M to P. I think you gave that answer earlier, which is the eight, right? So the reason why you chose the eight is because uh, tag, it is on the same row, so I, I figured that it must have something to do with the edge of MP. So you're correct, okay? It does have something to do with the edge MP, except eight is not the distance of the edge itself. Okay, so now what do we do? Okay, so you have to look at the way we compute the eight. What is the eight you know, representing? What is this eight representing? I mean, we know L of M got updated from 14 to eight. What is that meaning? What, 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 what does it mean? Why are we updating? Because we found a shorter path, okay? We found a shorter path from M to a destination. I don't care which one out of the three, we found a better way to get to a destination, that's all. But how do I know the new path has a length of eight? It's LP plus D. Exactly, it is L of P plus D of MP. Okay, so that means if I know the sum of those two terms is eight, if I can figure out one of those, I can figure out the other one. In other words, eight is the sum between L of P and D of MP. So if I can figure out what is L of P, then I would be able to figure out D of MP. So how do I figure out what is L of P? Right there. Exactly, it is right there. Um, a, B, blah, 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 blah. Oh, this is L of P, and we just look up the last update. It was a six. So six plus the distance of the edge MP ends up as eight. So what is the distance? It's two. Okay. So are you guys, you know, 
This is just an example of how I can give you a reverse problem where I give you the result of a trace and I go back and ask you, uh, what does the graph look like originally? Is that okay so far? Which also means I can also give you a partial graph, <laughs> erase some of the items of the trace, and have you try to figure out what is actually erased. What is supposed to be over there? I can have a mixture of both your know, forward tracing, which is you know, given all the variables go forward, and also going backwards, is, which is I give you, you know, the clue or you know, evidence left behind in the crime scene, and I'm asking you, who did what to whom at what time? It's plain detective with algorithms. So is the approach okay itself? I mean, do you guys understand you know, the general approach? The key is the algorithm. I'm kind of surprised that no one in the class said, Tara, can you bring up the algorithm? Because I kind of need to take a look at the algorithm to figure out the rest. I think some of you actually have it memorized just because of the homework assignment. And also we went over this just on Monday, right? But I think you know, it's, that's, that's the first, first thing, okay? To answer any question in any exam, in any subject, the first thing you want to do is, what, did, what was this class about? What, what were the topics that we went over? Because you're trying to make a match between the question and ideas, concepts, definitions, techniques, skills, and so on that you have learned over the semester. That's the first thing you need to do is to make that match. It doesn't have to be something like, oh, I know exactly how to use this thing that I learned to answer this question. You just want to make a match first. It's like, I think this has to do with that. There's strong evidence, you know, and I, I can use logic to deduce that these two things are connected. How exactly? Uh, I can work that out later. But you need to make that association. Is that making any sense? Okay, so now that I have introduced this type of, you know, question that I can ask. The next question is, isn't that a little bit too much for a class? I mean, why would, how would this be useful in a real job? Now, of course, if the answer is it would never be useful in a, new, in a real job, I would not have asked you that question, right? So the answer has to be a non-null value. The question is, in what situation do you think this is going to be useful? being able to do it in a backward way. Okay, let me, let me ask you a, a different question. W once you get your bachelor's degree, what are you gonna do? Other than you're know, just celebrating that you got your bachelor's degree? After that, what are you gonna do? Die. Die. <laughs> I, I, I think we're going to get there anyway, so no need to hurry the tri you know, to take a quick trip over there. So what, you, you guys are all going to look for a job, right? And um, on Monday's discussion, we, are, we already know that you know, AI is not everything, but they can do quite a bit already, okay? So now getting back to this original question is, uh, what is the whole point of being able to do something like this in a backward way? If you're in my CISP 310 class, you have some of that answer already because you know, we look at a trace of executing a program in assembly and we can use it to... What is the... Okay, that's one very good reason to do this. We can reverse engineer something. Debugging, yes, okay. So um, if you are going to become a you know, developer or a software engineer, you are going to have to debug something. And it's not just gonna be the code that you write. It's gonna be the code that somebody else's wrote 30 years ago with no comment whatsoever, okay? So how do you debug a program? Hmm? There are libraries, okay? So you can link a program with certain libraries, 
And if you have DDLs or dynamically linked libraries in Windows or a similar feature in Linux, you can basically say, okay, instead of using the standard you know, DLL, use this one here. So the special DLLs allows you to backtrace the whole thing, or at least they will be, be able to give you a memory dump of some kind when it does crash. Okay, It will give you some clue, hopefully, of what went wrong. That is basically what you're doing when you're executing a program backwards. Okay, what is reverse engineering? Because somebody threw, you know, threw that term out. So what is reversed engineering? And how does that relate to something like this? We know what is engineering, hopefully, right? I mean, to, to, to synthesize a design for the purpose of doing X, Y, and Z. Okay, there's a specification of what that, that thing is supposed to do. There are existing technology that you can use, and you're trying to use whatever is available to accomplish a particular task. So what is reversed engineering? You look at the way a program or a, if some code executes on a processor, and then you um, you mimic the way that it, it works with another program. Mimic, or you're trying to figure out how it got it done in the first place, mm -hmm. which is illegal in the United States. <laughs> Reverse engineering is illegal in the United States by the DMCA, the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So, but, 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 there are actual real life situations where you go like, I really need to do this and it's gonna be 100% legit and it's gonna be legal. It has to do with cybersecurity. So what type of scenario in cybersecurity do you think might have something to do with reversed engineering something? Uh, I think you got your hand up first. Go ahead. Sometimes you get virus. Mm hmm And? Piracy. Piracy? Okay, I can see that. So in those situations, you'll be looking at a server log, right? Or some kind of a log of activities, who signed in, who ran which, which command, you know, what are the URLs you know, being launched you know, against a certain server, and so on and so forth. That's your log. That is this thing here. What you're trying to do is to figure out how did that cause my server to go down? Or how did that lead to a leak of you know, um, information from the server? And so on. So you're still doing you know, the thinking in reverse. You're looking at the outcome of some kind. And you're trying to go back to try to figure out what is causing that to happen. Now, would you be actually reverse, reverse engineering uh, Dijkstra's algorithm? No. But the line of thinking is similar, with one big difference. You don't have the algorithm to begin with. <laughs> so you actually is going backward to try to figure out you know, how something happened. So cybersecurity has a lot of needs for people to do this. So once you're, you know, if the system is hacked, hopefully we can preserve as much state as possible so that we can analyze you know, what happened, okay? You know, we can look at all the traces left behind. But if you have you know, all kinds of traces of the traffic, TCP, IP, you know, traffic, and other types of your know, log, we can hopefully be able to piece enough evidence together to find out what happened. So do you think those are the things that can lend you jobs and you know, potentially get you a fairly well-paid job with certain type of uh, job security? I would think so. I want to copyright some malware. I think that'd be fun. Hmm. And you can't reverse engineer it. Okay, so let me let me digest that just a little bit. Okay, so there's copyright and there's patent. Um, if you copyright, then you are merely saying that no one else shall use this code for any purposes. If they do, you will sue them, right? You have the right to sue them. So if, if, if the people who will be copying your algorithm are criminals to begin with, you know, the threat of them being sued may not be very effective. Yeah. <laughs> but if it ends up on, so let's say I'm a professor at some university. Mm -hmm. I'm Professor Malware. 
I uh, got a bunch of malware, and it's put it on the internet, the copyright. So you're trying to become it's, Professor White Hat, right? And then uh, some criminals come along and copy my code, mm -hmm. and it ends up on a company's um, computer. Mm -hmm. And then they try to reverse engineer my algorithm, my malware, to figure out how they damage my computer. Then could I sue them? Probably not, but be funny. I'm trying to think, you know, whether that can be. Okay, so who are you suing? You're trying to sue I'm the person. The company. You're suing the company that got attacked, right? That got attacked. Yes. Okay, so you're kicking someone when that person is down. Exactly. <laughs> I think legally, that may be doable, <laughs> but you have to prove that that is actually your software. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think most of the time you're. Like suing for copyright infringement, you're suing for the monetary gain of the other party. Yep. So if you were reverse engineering for the sake <laughs> of education, you can pull out the what, one of the, the educational licenses and say, "Let's oh, for education, not monetary gain." And then your lawsuit falls apart. Well, then couldn't you just say, for educational purposes, I'm gonna uh, reverse engineer all closed source programs and put it on the internet? Yeah, but how would you access closed source programs in the first place without doing something illegal? Oh, well, good point. But uh, then would reverse engineering my algorithm in the first place be illegal? If it's not for monetary oh. gain, they can argue, you can argue. But if it's not for monetary gain for reverse engineering closed source programs. Well, okay, remember there are two things, because one is copyright and the other one is patent. Copyright is very specific, like you, know, you actually have to prove that these are the exact lines of code that your copyrighted you know, thing has, and you found it in this product here. That would be copyright. Patent is a lot more general. It is a way of doing things, an approach. You know, it's just you know, a method. So you know, if you were to patent something, it would be easier to sue someone for infringing on your patent. <clears throat> But you will still need to use reverse engineering to find out that, oh, that's exactly how they did it. And it matches you know, the method that I have already patented. So, um, so I think my recommendation to Anthony is to get a bachelor's degree in computer science and then go get a JD. Become a lawyer. Then you, become, you can become a patent lawyer. And do you guys have any idea of how much money patent lawyers make? Then I can make my own demand. Yes. Well, then you can you can choose. Yes, you can choose. So patent lawyers are interesting in the sense that they won't talk to you um, unless you put in. A, is it called a retention? Like you have to deposit like thirty thousand dollars in some account, and they know that you have that much money, you know, in the escrow account, to make sure that you can actually pay for the legal fees, and then they will talk to you. Many years ago, this is, I'm talking about 97, 96 or so, uh, the patent lawyer's office would charge like five, four or five hundred bucks an hour for the work they do. And most of the work are done by legal aides, so it's not actually, actually the lawyer doing the work, but they're going to charge you the same way. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Patent lawyers are, they make a lot of money, but you cannot just be a lawyer because JDs do not understand technology, software, um, and all the different terminology. But if you get a master's degree or even a bachelor's degree in computer science first, then you get a JD, then you have everything that you need to become a patent lawyer. And, uh, and that's, that's a lot of money. So there you go. And then if you guys are wondering, so tech, if you know that makes a lot of money, so how come you are not a, a patent lawyer? Easy. I don't have the skill to become a lawyer. I cannot remember things well enough to pass the bar. There's no way I can pass the bar at all. So I cannot become a lawyer. <laughs> yep. I just realized. If you, so you're, say you're Dr. Malware, right? And you publish all kinds of new bleeding edge malware. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the companies could sue you for their monetary gain. Yeah. Um, that would also be fun. Yeah, so they would just tell me too. Uh, well, that's a very interesting conversation because I think what would end up happening, because what you're doing is you're discovering zero-day exploits. Yes. 
So that's basically what you're, 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 you're doing. So when you are publishing that, you know, instead of you, you, instead of publishing the zero uh, big exploit using the correct channel, and you're just kind of releasing it, you know, you can get into problems because of that. On the other hand, if you go to one of those websites that keep track of zero day exploits and you just add an entry you know, on those websites, then you should be fine. Because you know, uh, the major companies like Microsoft and whatnot, they keep an eye on the zero exploit you know, list. So if you discover something, you list it, and, and Microsoft just kind of sit on, sits on its hand and decides, ah, we'll fix this later. And then three months later, they say, I'll fix this later. And then some hacker decided to go through that list and go like, yeah, I know it's going to be a long shot because it has to be discovered and published already, but I'll give it a shot anyway. So if that hacker ends up successfully you know, penetrating you know, some really secure website on the, on, the, on the internet, you are not going to be liable because you publish it at the right place so that the companies can do something about it. The companies decided not to do something about it. It's not going to be your fault. So it all depends on how that information gets disclosed. <laughs> Either way, it's going to be big money. Either you get paid the big money, or you get sued for big money. Do we have a meeting this Friday? Or? I don't think so. So yeah. last Friday, we decided that there won't be any meeting this Friday. Oh, okay. So we are, we are basically done then you know, with, uh, with the Design Hub. So, you know, there's not much to, to do at this point. I think you can check with Veronica to yeah. see if there's any clerical stuff left behind that you need to do mm -hmm. just to kind of close the, uh, the project. Yeah. But technically, I think we are good. Also, I'll put it to the GitHub of the organization. OK, so, so that, worked, that worked OK? Yeah. Everything went fine. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So you asked for uh, more you know, test questions. You know, that's yeah. basically my response to your question. Uh, instead of actually referring to the exam, because I did have an exam to the questions related like this. Okay. All right. Well, those questions you guys were going over at the start, I wasn't here when you guys started. Like, were those previous exam questions, or were those some like, random communication com combination questions? Like with the two heads, one tail? Uh -huh. Was that like a previous exam? Yeah, yeah. it was. <laughs> But that was a little bit too involved. I realized, oh man, that was a little bit too much. Yeah, that's a crazy question. <laughs> because there are too many subcases. Yeah. Uh, the quest, once you, but what I really was looking for is whether people recognize you know, the structure of the problem, that you start with a counting problem, and then you end up with uh, a binomial distribution problem. Okay. <laughs> so. You don't think we're gonna have any questions that involve an R exam, or? I, I would try not to. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's hard for me to assess, you know, how long it's gonna take for something. Yeah, okay. just go, hmm, that sounds like a really cool question. Because if you look at the question itself, it's not really long. I mean, you know, it's a pretty simple description, like six of these coins, seven of those coins, put in your pocket, mix it up, pick three coins out of the pocket, flip each one, you know, flip each one once, and then, what are the chances that you end up with two heads of one tail on the table? That doesn't sound too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> but then when you look at the actual way to do the calculation, it's like, oh, that's a little hairy. Yeah, I feel like there's so many ways to like, approach these like counting problems that <laughs> kind of makes them more difficult. Well, they should end up with the same value. Yeah. So uh, you know, Anthony came up with a way you know, which is just you know, based on how oh, you know uh, this number divided by that number times this number divided by that number, um, and my method, which is coming from the uh, Lotto problem, came up with exactly the same end result. Okay, so mine can simplify to what his you know answer is. Yeah. See, the, the hardest part of these problems is like trying to like visualize how to like arrange all like the trials and stuff, which. It's like different, Drawing like, out as a tree helps. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. different from like these kind of problems where you just look at the algorithm and try to figure it out. That's what. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Okay. Is it too much? How much I actually have to do this in the past year or so? Really? This reverse thing. I. So what? What do you start off with? Hmm. What? What is the? Uh, what is equivalent to, to this table? 
when you're in your work? Uh, in my work, what I usually have to get is a uh, system part of a